Hello, my name is Ray Hughes and I'm an interviewer for the Veterans History Project uh, conducted uh, by the Library of Congress and the interviews are being conducted here at the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library in Cincinnati, Ohio and the local administrator is Brian Powers who is our cameraman today. Today's date is the 14th of July, 2017. And we have the honor and privilege today of interviewing Dr. Robert Edwin Hamilton, a resident of the Cincinnati area and a veteran of the Vietnam War and Operation Desert Storm and a proud member of the United States Marine Corps, retired. It's a pleasure to meet you. Dr. Hamilton, is it all right to call you Bob? Absolutely, my all pleasure, right. Ray. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, if you would, uh, tell us when you were born and where you were born. I was born on uh, 24 June 1946 in St. Petersburg, Florida. I see. Uh, your, your father's name and mother's name? My father is Orman Hamilton, and my mother is Catherine Edmiston Hamilton. Edmiston was her maiden name. Yes, it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, what did your dad do for a living? You were in Florida. Well, um, my mother and father divorced when I was very young. Um, he was, uh, he had worked for the uh, railroad and uh, then he was an attorney in, in Miami, Florida. I see. And uh, how long did you live down there in uh, Florida then? Oh, I was about three or four when we left because I didn't start school till we moved to Ohio. I see. And uh, did your mother work? Uh, no, uh, we lived with my grand her, her parents, my grandparents, and uh, my grandmother was quite ill uh, with uh, severe rheumatoid arthritis, and she stayed home most of the time and took care of her. She did some volunteer work as a candy striper and things like that, but mm -hmm. uh, primarily she stayed at home. I see. What was your grandparents' name on your? Uh, my side? grandfather was Edward Estes Edmiston, and my grandmother was Bertie Edmiston. I see. Now, where did they live? Did they live? They lived in Cleveland. In Cleveland. And uh, they had uh, moved up there from uh, Kentucky. They were originally from uh, Crab Orchard, Kentucky. Ah, yes, yes. Uh, and so when you left Florida, you went to Cleveland? Yes. I see. Uh, you recall where you lived at in Cleveland? Uh, initially, we lived in downtown Cleveland in an apartment building. And uh, we moved from there out to uh, Chagrin Falls, Ohio, which was a sleepy little farm community at that time. Right. And uh, from there, we moved into Cleveland Heights, Ohio. I see. Uh, did your mother remarry? No, never no, remarried. Never remarried. I see. Um, what schools did you go to there in, in Cleveland? Well, I went uh, to Chagrin Falls Elementary School. And uh, then when we moved into Cleveland Heights, I attended uh, Coventry Elementary School and Roxboro Junior High School. And my high school was uh, University School, which was a uh, private prep school. I see. I was, I was recruited. They thought I was smarter, could play sports, and I fooled them on all, sport, all angles. What sports did you play? I played uh, ba football, basketball, and baseball. I see. Uh, and at the uh, completion of high school, um, did you go on to college? Yes, I went to a Center College down in Danville, Kentucky. I see. And what were, you, what were you going to major in, or what did you major in? Um, I had a double major in history and, and uh, government. I see. And I had a, a goal of going to law school. I see. Um, when did you graduate from Center College? Graduated in 1968. 1968? Yes. At the height of the Vietnam War? Yes. Um, well, what did you do after you graduated in 1968? Well, in 1967, I signed up for the Marine Corps PLC program, and, and between my Junior and senior years, I spent 10 glorious weeks at uh, Quantico, Virginia uh, in an OCS program. And when I graduated, I was commissioned a second lieutenant in the Marine Corps. And uh, in August of 68, I reported to flight school in Pensacola, Florida. What's PLC mean? Uh, platoon leaders class. I see. And uh, if you would give me those dates again when you went through that training? Uh, I went through platoon leaders class in the summer of 1967. Mm -hmm. And then uh, when did you join the Marine Corps as? Uh, and when I graduated in uh, June of 68, um, then I went in August of 68, I went to flight school. 
I see, and that was where? Pensacola, Florida. Uh, and um, did you have to go through regular boot camp? Well, the OCS program between junior and senior years was considered our boot camp. It was very physical. Uh, we lost about 50% attrition rate, and um, it was just, uh, it, was, it was nice to survive. When I, when I got home, I was in such good shape, I'd just say, I gotta go run. <laughs> Did you, uh, what, what time of year was it that you went through the uh, boot camp? It was in summer of 67 from uh, June to August. And was that anywhere near Paris Island? No, uh, Quantico is in uh, Northern Virginia, just outside of uh, Washington, D.C. It had to be uh, pretty humid weather though when you were going Very through. hot and humid, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you're at Pensacola now, and um, what, explain your training there at Pensacola to, for us. Well, the, the training is set up in stages. Uh, the very first aircraft that we flew was the, the T-34, which is a small Beechcraft single engine aircraft, and we, uh, we progressed through that, and that was our first solo aircraft. And uh, from there, we went on uh, uh, to either a jet pipeline or a helicopter pipeline, uh, which was decided upon whatever the Marine Corps needed most. Mm -hmm. uh, I think two people out of my class went into jets and everybody else went into helicopters. And uh, we went from there to uh, Milton, Florida, where we flew the T-28. And um, we also uh, f flew uh, uh, the T-28 to make carrier landings. And uh, then we went on to Ellison Field. And uh, that's where we flew helicopters. We flew the uh, uh, jet Bell Jet Ranger and then we flew uh, Hueys in, uh, in training and uh, got my wings in October of 1969. I see. Um, what's a T-28? For t twenty eight is a single engine aircraft. Uh, it was designed as a fighter aircraft. It came out at the end of World War II but never saw any combat action. Um, had an R-1820 uh, radial engine up front. It was very, very overpowered for the aircraft. and. Uh, the Navy had a lot of them, and that's what we that's what we learned to fly. Is where we did a lot of aerobatics and, and things like that. And the uh, Bell jet. It's the small uh, uh, jet, uh, small uh, Bell helicopter. Um, not great for instruments, but that's where we first got our, our feet wet as far as flying helicopters and learning to hover and exciting things like that. Yeah. And until uh, we moved on to the uh, the, the Huey. Now the Huey, there are several different models of that. Which were you training out in that area? The, um, the Navy had the UH-1D uh, model down there in, uh, in Pensacola, and there was also the UH-1L they had later. I see. And now, are you a part of the Navy now as a naval aviator, or are you Marine Corps? No, I'm strictly Marine Corps, um, but the training command uh, incorporated all the Marines and, and Navy pilots. I see. And, you're at Ellison uh, Naval Air Station at this time, and where's yes. that located at? Uh, it's in Pensacola. Um, it's now closed, um, but it, it was a, a great little field uh, right there in Pensacola, almost as, as close as you could get to the downtown of Pensacola. We, one of the reasons they closed it is the air traffic started to conflict with uh, Pensacola's regional airport, mm -hmm. and uh, so we, they closed down Ellison Field. So you graduated uh, from flight training at when? October of 1969. October 69. And um, did you get a leave then or were you immediately stationed somewhere? No, I went, I took uh, a little bit of leave. I, I traveled up to, uh, I was transferred to uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina to New River Air Station. And um, I went to check in and they said, well, do you want to fly the CH-53 or the CH-46? And I really didn't want to fly either one of them. So I said, well, I'm going to take some leave. So I took 17 days leave and I came back and they said, do you want to fly Hueys? And I said, yes. And so that's how I got into the Huey squadron at, uh, at, uh, at New River. Uh, explain a Huey to us, uh, the number of passengers that it can fly. And it well, it depends on the model. The Marine Corps was flying the, uh, the UH-1E, uh, which had a little bit smaller cabin, um, but was designed primarily uh, as a, uh, a gunship with uh, externally mounted uh, uh, weapons. 
It would carry possibly six in the back, and a pilot and co-pilot, and a crew chief. And uh, but that was that would have been a pretty heavy load if they were armored armored troops to to get off the ground. Now, did you have a specific crew on each mission that uh, once you were assigned an aircraft? Uh, yes, there was a crew chief that would come with uh, with the aircraft. Um, that that aircraft was 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 his baby. He'd eat and sleep with that aircraft and uh, uh, made sure that it was in top mechanical condition. Uh, went through all the proper checks, all the proper maintenance, and everything like that. And mm -hmm. uh, they, those aircraft belonged to those those crew chiefs. I see. So after you were assigned your, your Huey, uh, where were you uh, stationed and or where were you sent for duty? Um, well, after uh, uh, I, I was there at New River Air Station, we were just, uh, I was what was called a PUI, a pilot under instruction. Um, I had my wings, I was a designated aviator, but there was still more to learn, especially about Marine Corps flying and close air support of the troops and, and things of this nature. And so we would have daily flights with experienced pilots, uh, most of who have, all of whom had been to Vietnam already. And they would come back and, and share their wisdom with us and share their experiences and uh, try to help us if we got into similar situations that uh, they, they had gotten into that weren't too, weren't too friendly. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, I was, uh, I was selected to go to uh, Savannah, to Hunter Army Airfield in Savannah, Georgia for a month and transition to the Cobra, the uh, AH-1G uh, Cobra, uh, which was an Army command down there because the Marine Corps didn't have any Cobras of their own. Uh, all the Cobras the Marine Corps had were, they had gotten from the Army. Mm -hmm. So they were sending all their pilots to uh, the Army school to learn to fly the Cobra. How's the Cobra differed from your uh, UH-1E? The Cobra was designed to be a stable weapons platform. Uh, the Cobra, the Huey has a a lot of inherent vibration and makes it difficult to, to shoot rockets or to shoot guns because you're moving all over the place. And the, the Cobra was designed with a lot of uh, uh, servos to dampen out uh, these inherent vibrations and make a stable weapons platform. Uh, it was 36 inches wide to make it a poor target. And uh, so we were the we were the attack aircraft, we were the, the gun support that uh, the guys on the ground and the other, the other helicopters liked to have us along because the, the bad guys knew that if we could spot them, we could get them, so they would leave other people alone. Mm -hmm. And how long were you down there at uh, Hunter training? Down at Hunter for a month. Uh -huh. And your crew's with you? No, just by myself. Um, I went with another Marine Corps major. Uh, we, we roomed. Uh, my roommate's name was Sir, and uh, uh, we transitioned to the Cobra. He, uh, he wound up being the maintenance officer of the squadron, and he and I became good friends and are still good friends to this day. And his last name is what? Bird. Malcolm Bird. Malcolm Bird. I see. Um, and where did you go from there? From there, I went to uh, Okinawa. Uh, spent. Uh, about six weeks in Okinawa, and um, I was a little frustrated because uh, I, was I was sent to school, the Marine Corps spent a lot of money to teach me to fly the Cobra for a month, and I got waylaid in, uh, in Okinawa flying VIPs in Hueys. Uh, uh -huh. And uh, a good friend of mine uh, in flight school came through Okinawa. Uh, he was there for a special school, and I ran into him, and I gave him a letter to give to the CO of the Cobra Squadron in Vietnam. Say you've got four pilots who are Cobra trained sitting here in Okinawa doing nothing. And in about a week's time we were down in Vietnam. What, what base were you on in, in, in Okinawa? Uh, we were at Futima Air Station. Futima Marine Corps Air Station. Where, is that, how close is that to Kadena? Um, well, it or Naha? Naha was south of us, um, Kadena was uh, uh, west of us, but uh, everything was really pretty close there in Okinawa. Mm -hmm. um, so you, uh, you voiced your opinion and uh, to be transferred, what about the other guys in Cobras, did they go with you or just yourself? No, the other four guys, the other three guys also went. 
Um, one of them was Malcolm Byrd, and um, I think that uh, that, would have, that was his third tour in Vietnam. And so uh, I think he would have been happy to stay in Vietnam, but in, in, in Okinawa, but I opened my mouth and so we all got transferred down there. Um, now, do you have your crew with him when you're transferred? No, no crew in the Cobra. Oh, no. Cobra is just a pilot and a co-pilot. Okay. Um, and uh, there, there is no flying crew in the, in the Cobra, no, no passenger capability. Okay. You're to provide support and attack. Is that how you would term it? We were, we were there to provide close air support uh, for the guys on the ground. That was our, that was our main mission. Where did you uh, uh, first arrive at? Where at in Vietnam? Uh, we landed in Da Nang, and um, I got off the aircraft, and um, there was Colonel Don Conroy. Um, he was the uh, he was the head of the flight training when I first checked into Pensacola. And uh, there was a movie uh, made about Donald Conroy, and I'm trying to think of the name of the, the, the Great Santini. And Donald Conroy was the Great Santini, and the book was written by his son. And uh, we got off the plane, and he called us by name. Uh, he knew us from flight school, or he had pictures of us anyway. He knew who was going to get off the plane. We went over to a, this was a, First Marine Aircraft Wing, and we went over to the uh, to a building and sat down, and they threw papers at us. And one of the papers we had to sign was called the Rules of Engagement. And the Rules of Engagement essentially said that we did not have permission to fire a shot unless we were cleared by a higher authority, even if somebody was shooting at us. And uh, I looked at this and said, "Well, this really stinks. What if I don't sign this?" And they said, "You'd get back on the airplane." So I signed it. And from there, I went uh, by a vehicle over to Marine Air, Crew, Air Group 16 and assigned to Helicopter Squadron HML 367. This, uh, before we move on, this Donald Conroy, uh, how, how accurately portrayed did uh, uh, the famous movie star play his part? Uh, um, Duvall. Yeah, yeah Robert, Robert Duvall. Duvall. How accurately? Well, I never saw a lot of that was oriented around family life and, and uh, things like that. He, was a, he had been an F-4 pilot and uh, this was now past that. He was more into his mellow stage, I guess. We never, we never saw any of that. Uh -huh. um, we, we saw him and knew him only by name at that time and the, certainly the movie hadn't come, or the book or the movie hadn't come out yet. So uh, uh, everybody loved Donald Conroy because he he would remember us. He uh, uh, had us all into his office and sat us down, the new, new flight students, and then had a chit-chat with us, which is, uh, was not what we expected as new second lieutenants in the Marine Corps to have a colonel sit us down and have a chit-chat. So uh, we, uh, we all liked Donald Conroy. Mm -hmm. uh, so you were assigned to HML 367, is that correct? Yes. What does HML mean? Um, Helicopter Marine Corps Light. Okay, and this is a uh, Cobra. Cobra squadron, the only Marine Corps Cobra squadron. The only one. Only one. Uh, at that at that time. Uh -huh. And uh, are you still at Da Nang? Yes. Okay. Well, if you would continue. Well, we were at Da Nang. Uh, the the airfield was uh, called Marble Mountain Air Facility. Um, we were right on the coast but right at the south end of the runway were these big granite rocks that came up out of the ground and uh, those were the Marble Mountains and uh, that's how the airfield got its, got its name. And uh, I reported as a young inexperienced second lieutenant and went through all of the, uh, the protocol of, as such. Uh, we lived in uh, metal Quonset huts. Uh, the first one I lived in I had, they were divided into quarters and the first, first one I lived in I had two roommates and uh, later on, I would have just one room, one roommate. I got more, got more senior. Yeah. <laughs> if there's seniority among lieutenants, is uh, is not something that's uh, really recognized. But uh, we, uh, you start out as a, a junior co-pilot, and um, Cobra's never left as a single aircraft. We always went at least two aircraft. So uh, as a as a junior co-pilot, you were in the second aircraft, and you. 
you listened and learned. You learned to read the maps. You learned the geographic area. Um, you learned the lingo that you heard coming over the airways. And uh, after a period of time and after judgment of the pilot you flew with, you'd be appointed a senior co-pilot and you'd fly in the lead aircraft. And uh, more responsibility, uh, especially as far as maps and, and locations and, and uh, uh, getting the aircraft and the other group where the other people where they're supposed to be. Um, after a period of time, uh, you would be given some time in the back seat and your pilot would fly in the front seat as a co-pilot in the co-pilot position and you'd be evaluated and you would be made a hack, helicopter aircraft commander. And uh, you started out then as the second aircraft in a flight of two or the fourth, or fourth aircraft in a flight of four or something like that and then would work your way up to uh, a section leader which would be two aircraft or a flight leader which would be four aircraft. Uh, what caliber of, ammo, uh, of ammunition did you folks fire, carry? The Cobra had a, a chin turret that had uh, um, a 40 millimeter grenade launcher and uh, the standard uh, rounds that went in an M16 rifle, the 7.62 uh, ammunition, mm -hmm. um, which was belt fed. And uh, the problem we would have if the ammunition would get a little bit out of the linkage, a little bit long or short, it would jam the guns. Mm -hmm. Then we also had rocket pods on either side. We shot uh, uh, 2.75 um, uh, folding fin aerial rockets. And uh, we carried 19 shot uh, rocket pods inboard and we carried high explosive uh, uh, rockets there. And outboard we had um, uh, Willie Pete or white phosphorus rockets for smoke. So we could lay down smoke screens and, and things like that. I'm curious how the ammo was fed, these rockets. Um, underneath the pilot compartment were big, like chests. And uh, the, uh, the ammo was layered in there um, in, a, in a metal linkage. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then it would be fed into the into the guns and uh, into the turret. And uh, the pilot, the co-pilot, had a uh, it was a flexible, movable uh, sight, and he could pick it up and, and move it in any direction and slew it. I want to say 115 degrees off of center, so a little bit behind us. I, I may be wrong on that number, mm -hmm. but um, uh, it was a nice weapon. Uh, the, uh, it was a six-barrel Gatling gun that would shoot 3,000 rounds a, a minute, and so it was very impressive at night. And uh, the, uh, the grenade launcher we used many times because it was very inaccurate. It was a lofted round, and we would uh, uh, use it to, if a, if a transport helicopter was going to go into a zone uh, with nobody in the zone, we would shoot the, the uh, grenades into the zone to set off any potential mines that, that may have been there just mm -hmm. from the concussion of the grenade uh, grenade rounds. Yeah. Well, continue then. Well, um, we had a series of missions that we would fly. Um, some of them would be pretty boring. Uh, we'd do a lot of resupply. The, uh, the CH-46, which is the long uh, helicopter with two, two large rotors on either end, were the, uh, the main transport helicopters, and they would fly supplies out to the field of the troops and we would escort them. And uh, that would be generally just a lot of long hours. Um, the Cobra had a closed cockpit. The, the plexiglass came completely over. And so we were in a, a little bit of a, a greenhouse and it would get quite warm. Well, we had a air conditioning system built in but um, if that air conditioning system wasn't working and the aircraft was still flying, that aircraft went flying. So you might have a pretty hot day out there too uh, with the, the environmental control unit uh, if it wasn't working. Um, we did uh, a strike missions where we were going to insert troops into a particular area. We'd come in uh, as, as stealthily as, as we could and, and uh, set up an area and the, the transports would drop off the, uh, drop the troops off. We did missions with the uh, uh, recon units dropping uh, 
uh, six, seven man teams out in the, the middle of nowhere. Um, we, uh, we flew medevac escort missions, which were very important missions. Uh, medevac, night medevac was always exciting. Any night flying was always exciting because there were no, no street signs or McDonald's down there to orient off of. And uh, we'd fly night medevac from six at night till six in the morning. Medevac means what, uh, Bob? Uh, we would go out to pick up wounded soldiers, wounded Marines, um, any emergencies that they might have, we would be the first ones that, uh, that would get the call. And uh, we'd be sitting there ready to go. We'd get a call on the radio and crank up the aircraft. And uh, the, the senior co-pilot would stay behind to get the coordinates, the map coordinates of uh, where we were headed. And uh, we'd, we'd head out and uh, Orient, uh, the, the Cobras always led the mission out. We'd contact the unit on the ground. We'd set everything up for the pickup aircraft so that they didn't have to worry about anything except getting in and getting out. And uh, those, were, those were exciting little missions. Um, probably the, we always kidded the recon guys because it seems like we'd always get a call for an emergency extraction of a recon unit at sunset just as they were out of ammunition and surrounded. And uh, we'd kid them that they started making noise about that time of night so they could get home for hot chow. But uh, those, those would turn into some pretty dicey affairs. And uh, uh, we, we, could get some, we could get some free beers at the bar from the recon guys after pulling a recon team on an emergency extraction like that. Is this 1969 or, is, or are we into No, this would have been um, 70, 71. Um, I got there in... Uh, August of 70 and left in June of 71. Okay, so this is 1970 right. through 71. Right. Uh, if, you, if you wish to, you could explain some of the missions that you were on. And I think uh, it says you got 50 air medals. Uh, I think they changed the criteria for air medals for you guys. Uh, if I remember correctly, during World War II, you had to fly five missions to get an air medal. What was the uh, criteria the, there in Vietnam? The criteria was, I believe it was 20 mission, 20 mission credits for an air medal. And you'd get one mission credit if you went to a secured position and two mission credits if you took fire. I believe that's what it was. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the, the co-pilots were responsible for filling out all that paperwork when we got back. Uh -huh. And you were awarded, if I read correctly, 50 air medals. Yes. Which is a compilation of some combat flying time, meaningful, long, many missions. It also, uh, I think you told me at one time you were shot down, is that correct? Yes. Um, Thanksgiving of um, 70, uh, flying night medevac. Uh, I was co-pilot with uh, Major Bob Sheehan, and uh, we got a call to go out. Uh, the weather was terrible. Um, there was about a 200, 200 300 foot ceiling, uh, and we flew uh, from Marble Mountain Airfield, we flew south on Highway 1, which was the main highway up and down the coast of Vietnam. And the reason we flew it, there were vehicles that had uh, headlights. And we could kind of follow that, follow them to get where we were going. And we went, to, we went south down to, uh, we wanted to get to Hill 5-5. Five five. Uh, and we got down there and we started, we got contact with the unit and they were in the foothills on the, uh, the south side of the Quezon Mountains. And uh, so we told them to pop a flare, and uh, they did, and we could see a glow. So we headed up, kind of weaving in and out between the hills, and uh, we got in, we found them, we located them, and uh, we went into an orbit uh, a little bit west of them. We didn't want to orbit right over them because that would make them a target. So. Uh, we were a little bit west of them, and the ceiling came down more and more, and we kind of got trapped because the ceiling came down below the hilltops. So we were trapped in a little dish down there, flying around, 
And uh, they kept popping flares, which they thought was helping us. But in reality, the, when a, a flare goes up and then it comes down and the light, the relative motion of the light made it disorienting. And uh, so we're up there and we're, we're flying around trying to decide if we're gonna try to get the, the, the pickup uh, helicopter in there to pick up their uh, wounded. They had, uh, they had taken some rocket propelled grenades in the zone and had some wounded people. And then we started taking fire. And um, I heard the warning horn, which means we're, you're low RPM. And uh, looked at the gauges and could tell that we were, we were losing power, we were going down. And uh, the pilot sitting in the front, the co-pilot sitting in the front seat has much better straight ahead visibility than the pilot in the back. And uh, I remember we're, we're drilled on emergency procedures and one of the things is always lock your harness so I, I can remember actually physically reaching down and locking my my restraint harness uh, which seems kind of funny that I would remember that right in the middle of everything but my goal was to make sure that we didn't hit on high ground and roll I wanted to make sure we were going to at least hit in low ground and have a chance and so uh, as we, we went down and uh, all of a sudden everything went dead quiet and still. And uh, Bob Sheehan in the back says, you okay? I said, yeah, you okay? He says, let's get out of here. So we got out of the aircraft and we had to take all of our, our charts and our frequency cards and everything like that with us. And uh, we got out of the aircraft and the, the transmission was laying on the ground next to the aircraft. Uh, the guys on the hill said that as we came down, the rotor hit the side of the hill and shattered. He said it was like shrapnel flying everywhere. And it ripped the transmission right out of the aircraft, which Bell Helicopter said wasn't physically possible. But we proved them wrong on that. And so we're standing there kind of, yeah, we're still here. And uh, all of a sudden, crashing through the, the underbrush come about six Marines and, and startled the heck out of us. And uh, he said, follow us. So we, we followed them back up the hill and uh, we got up on the hill with the, it was uh, a reinforced platoons. So there weren't a whole lot of guys up there, but uh, uh, there were some and, and uh, we had on board, we had what was called a KY-28 radio. That was the first cipher radio that the military had. And uh, MIT had been given the radio to try to break the cipher code in it and hadn't been able to do it. We had just had a lecture on how it was more valuable than human life if the, if the bad guys got this radio, why they could uh, get in our most confidential conversations. So he was a major, I was a lieutenant. Guess who was elected to go back down to the aircraft and get the radio? The lieutenant. The lieutenant. So myself and about five or six Marines went down there and I got in the tail boom of the aircraft and got the radio out and uh, pulled it out and went back up on the hill and I shared a, shared a foxhole with Lance Corporal Jesse Finch the rest of the night and got eaten up by mosquitoes and, and uh, uh, learned how scared I could get that night and knew why I wanted to be back in the air and not on the ground. And uh, we, uh, we got picked up the next morning. Uh, the best news was that the, the two guys that were wounded did great, they survived quite nicely and uh, uh, the only the only casualty was a uh, was one aircraft I see uh, what's a cipher radio cipher meaning ability to decipher something? it was a, it was a co it was electronically put into a code so that nobody else could listen to it unless you had a similar radio uh -huh. uh, nowadays with computers and the electronics we have why uh, I'm sure it's like a model T compared to everything we've got nowadays, but that was the first thing we had. Um, we had we had radio codes we tried to use to think we were fooling the bad guys, and I'm sure they knew them just as well as we did, but uh, things like uh, uh, we had uh, certain radio frequencies on FM, we say go eyeball. Well, that meant go to 2020 on the radio, or uh, on the UHF, go to go Winchester, that's 357 for a 357 Magnum. Right. Uh, Go Jack Benny, that was 40.00. And uh, so we had these little little codes that we would use, uh, which 
like I say, I'm sure the bad guys had heard long enough that they, they knew what they were too. So. But uh, we thought we were fooling them. So what happened when you got back to the base? You, after you after having... Got back to the base and uh, I was told to report to the flight surgeon. And I did and he grounded me for 24 hours. And I went over to the Huey squadron and flew with a buddy of mine in a Huey instead. And I went back and flew with my squadron the next day. And you had another Cobra? Yes. And uh, your uh, co-pilot, was he with you through all this? Well, I was the co-pilot. Oh, I'm sorry. I was the co-pilot yeah. for the major. And uh, he, was the, he was the admin officer of the squadron and uh, a great guy. Uh, we, he was known as the Leprechaun. Uh, Sheehan, a good, a good red-headed Irishman. And, uh, but no, we, we, we changed pilots and co-pilots almost every flight. Oh, okay. So that way you, you continue, it was a continual learning process uh, of experience as opposed to just being molded in somebody else's image. Now, each one of the times that you go out is considered a mission. Is that yes. correct? And, and how many missions would you say that you flew in uh, Vietnam? Oh, goodness. Um, I wouldn't, I couldn't, couldn't say. <coughs> Excuse me. The, um, the missions would be assigned the night before. Um, I worked in operations and I was one of the guys that would assign them. We'd get, we'd get what we call frags from the, the air group and these would be missions that would be going the next day and how many aircraft were required. And so we'd take the number of aircraft, we'd, we'd assign the pilots and co-pilots and we'd publish a, a flight schedule that may not come out till 12, 1 o'clock in the morning. And we'd post it where everybody would see it. We'd go post it in the head down in the, the living quarters. So everybody would, they'd, they'd get up in the middle of the night and go check the flight schedule to see what they were flying uh, the next day. But uh, how many missions, I, I, I couldn't say. I don't know, about every, about every fifth day I didn't fly. I worked as an operations duty officer and I sat at the desk and manned the phone and uh, handled all the emergencies that came in uh, emergency flights that had to be, uh, emergency missions that had to be covered, uh, things like that. And uh, so that took away some time from me. But uh, I, I, I don't know, because you might fly, fly more than one mission in a day too, so sure. hard to say. Yeah. Um, are you still a lieutenant, when, uh, a second lieutenant, or are you a first, a first lieutenant, lieutenant now? No. Yes, and I, I was all, all the way up to first lieutenant. Uh, made that when I was at New River, before I went to Vietnam. Okay. And uh, we had uh, the, the the majority of the squadron was first lieutenants, and we had what was called the LPA, Lieutenants Protection Association. We all banded together, and uh, we had very few captains. Those would have been second tour pilots, but the the captains that we had were just outstanding people, outstanding pilots, and. Uh, they, they, they just taught the lieutenants so well. And we had, a, a, we had actually more majors than we did captains. And these were generally third tour pilots. And uh, we, we would, we would kind of joke among ourselves that when the, some of the nasty missions would come up, the, the majors would go hide. But if I were a third tour major, I'd go hide too, I think, thinking the percentages were gonna catch up with me. But, uh, it was many times the lieutenants that were out kind of leading a lot of the, the uh, a lot of the night medevacs and, and, and things like this. But uh, we had a great group of majors also because they adopted the lieutenants and put up with a certain amount of grief from us and uh, let us let us go, but kept the leash on us and knew when to kind of tug us back. And uh, we had a we had a really good group of guys over there. Um, finest people I've known. I noticed uh, that you were awarded a <coughs> bronze star with a V, which means for valor. No, that was a Navy Achievement Medal with a combat V. I'm sorry. What, uh, what did that, why, why did you receive that and for what? Did that was essentially an, uh, an end of tour award. Um, most everybody got something. Uh, most lieutenants got a Navy Achievement Medal and it was uh, recognized with the combat V for the, the time in combat. So there was, that was not for a specific uh, event or anything like that. Okay. 
And what about your, your DFC, Distinguished Flying Cross? Um, I had two Distinguished Flying Crosses. One was, um, one was for rescuing, doing an emergency extract of a recon team at night. Um, and the other was uh, a compilation, uh, Lamson 719 was a mission where we reopened Quezon and uh, we're over west of Quezon and into Laos supporting the uh, South Vietnamese Army trying to cut off the Ho Chi Minh Trail. And I had more hours than anybody in the squadron on that mission, which was um, not a good mission. A lot, of, a lot of bad guys over in that area. Could you go into some detail about that Ho Chi Minh Trail? Well, we would, <clears throat> the, uh, it was supposed to be an Army operation, and the Army large helicopters, the Chinook, um, which would carry artillery pieces, was all of a sudden grounded for mechanical reasons, the whole fleet of them. So the Army came to the Marine Corps and asked if the, the CH-53, the Marine Corps big heavy lifter, um, could go up and be part of this mission. And they said, only if we send our own gun support, send our own Cobras to, to cover our Marines. And uh, so we would fly from uh, Da Nang area, uh, up north, uh, up to Quang Tree. We'd turn, uh, turn west out of Quang, Quang Tree and uh, go over the first uh, set of hills and mountains, uh, fire support base Vandegrift, and then around a little further west to, to Quezon. And uh, when the Marines had pulled out of Quezon, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly when they pulled out, but uh, certainly that was a, uh, a big battle for the Marines at Quezon. But uh, there were minefields all around and, and everything else, so they'd, they'd been in there and they'd laid down a new airstrip, uh, and uh, we could go in there. There was a refuel pit and a rearm pit, and uh, we, would, we would work out of there. And we flew west out of there over into Laos, uh, supporting the North Vietnamese uh, and uh, we, so, they, they uh, were supporting who? The, the South, I'm sorry, the South Vietnamese Army. Mm -hmm. um, we saw things like uh, arc lights. Uh, an arc light was a big B-52 mission and we'd hear it on the radio and they'd give a grid square coordinates and we'd plot it on the map and uh, we'd look up and this, this whole grid square would just disappear into dust. Uh, so many bombs were dropped in that area and uh, the Air Force was up there and they were doing over-the-shoulder bombing which was next to useless uh, where they would dive at a target they would pull up and then release their ordnance and it would just kind of float through the air and the only thing it would hit would be the ground um, they weren't sure where but it would hit the ground yeah. and uh, we went up there we had a, a 53 take a mortar round uh, in a in a landing zone, um, nobody got seriously hurt, but the aircraft was right in the middle of the zone, and uh, there was a crew there. So we waited till dusk, and uh, it was actually an army Huey that snuck in and uh, was able to land and pick the crew up and fly them out. And uh, that helicopter just got pushed off the side of the hill. Uh, it was non salvageable. Uh, we were up. Uh, one day a mission of four, air, four aircraft and uh, the uh, number two aircraft, I was, a sec I was a second section leader and the number two aircraft on the first section, we were just shooting at a spot in the jungle and he hit some sort of ammunition dump or something and it exploded and we had all this uh, um, white hot phosphorus fire burning and everything else. and. Uh, all sorts of things up there. We were sitting there in a zone one day, and uh, this is when they had the, the things on TV back here about the, the Hueys coming in with guys hanging onto the, the skids of the Hueys. These were the, the South Vietnamese. And we're sitting there waiting for a call to, to head out and relieve some other group, and all of a sudden a, an artillery round went off right in the middle of the zone, and we scrambled, and we got in our aircraft, and uh, we got out of there and uh, my wingman actually got off the ground before I did and he's coming around this way headed in the direction the artillery came from and I got my radios on I said Sexton where are you going he said oh I thought I'd put up some token resistance 
Well, we didn't. We just uh, we got out of there and uh, and uh, got back to a safer position. But uh, yeah, we ate a lot of ate a lot of sea rations up there and uh, just sat by many times waiting for a call to to go do our thing, or we'd have we'd just be relieving another another set of aircraft while one would refuel and re rearm and. They'd get low on fuel, and we'd go out and relieve them, and they'd relieve us. Where did you refuel at? Uh? They had uh, just they have these huge bladders uh, that sit in the ground, and they're just full of fuel. And uh, they they, had, they would have aircraft that would just bring in the bring in fuel that the C one thirties could land on the fuel strip at uh, at Quezon, and they would just fill these things up with fuel, mm -hmm. and that uh, we could go back there. And uh, they also had the rearming pits where we could get more uh, more rockets and and uh, and uh, other uh, ammunition for the chin turret and things like that. Did you uh, have any uh, personal contact with the North North Vietnamese or Viet Cong? No, no. Um, the night we got shot down, um, I, I pulled my head out of the uh, the tail boom of the aircraft while I was recovering that radio, and the one Marine says, "Freeze, bad guys." 50 meters, nine o'clock. So that was that was as close as I got as far as a contact with any North Vietnamese or Viet Cong that I know of. While you were there, did you carry a sidearm while you were? I did. I uh, I had a 38 um, that I carried, and then later I, I had a uh, kind of a uh, cut down um, uh, M16 that uh, I would carry, as a, as a pilot, you had a space behind you that you could store things. As a co-pilot, you didn't. There was no place to put anything like that. So I just carried a 38, but um, as a pilot, then I could carry this uh, uh, M16 up behind me. Did you have the blood shit? Or? Yes. We had certain missions that we would be issued the blood shit. There was a, there was a radio relay station uh, due west of Da Nang, up on what we call Sugarloaf Mountain. And uh, every once in a while we'd, we'd have to fly over there and take them and resupply them. And it was a, it was a challenge because you're reading the one to 50,000 contour maps to uh, find where they're located. You're reading one mountain after another, you know, have we got the right mountain and where are we going? And uh, we would carry blood chits uh, on, those, on those particular missions but not routinely. Um, one time when we were, we were coming back from one of those missions, um, I was flying co-pilot for the guy who was later best man at my wedding, and we looked down, there was a B-25. And we got on guards, guard radio and we called him, and it was, a, it was an Australian flying B-25s over there, and uh, uh, we just kind of checked in with him, see what he was doing, and, and uh, he was talking, well, mate this and mate that and uh, everything else. And, uh, we, we, we had no idea that there were such things over there. <laughs> World War II aircraft. Yeah. yeah. Same one that Doodle Raiders used. Absolutely. Uh, did you, uh, speaking of that, we often forget that there were Australians uh, in combat over there and uh, South Koreans. Yes. Uh, did you uh, serve with any of those folks? The Rock Marines, um, their Air Force was stationed at our airfield. At Da Nang. At, at Marble Mountain. Mar Marble Mountain, yeah. And um, they had uh, small uh, prop aircraft that they would fly in and out of there. And uh, whenever we hear on the radio, this is, this is Rock Marine such and such and such coming in, everybody get out of their way, because they were, they were coming in. <laughs> and uh, we didn't know how much English they understood. And uh, there was a Rock Marine uh, unit south of us, and uh, a friend of mine uh, took a tour as a forward observer with the Rock Marines. And uh, he was with binoculars spotting air, spotting air strikes and spotting artillery for the Rock Marines. He said he got tired of eating kimchi after a while. He, he wanted to get back and have a good, good American meal, but uh, he said they treated him pretty well. Did, uh, did you uh, serve with or around any South Vietnamese? No, not really. Um, we they'd, they'd parade some high ranker through every once in a while just to 
for show, but we never really had, I never really had any direct uh, uh, workings with any of them. Our Australians, perhaps? No, that was, that was our only experience with the Australians, was that B-25. Yeah. What core is, uh, was Marble Mountain and? i core i core Yes. Okay. Um, did you ever have to land around the Ho Chi Minh Trail? Right. No, never was on the ground over that way. Um, no, we were we were in the air. Uh, there was a we got a, we heard a call on the radio when we were up there in Laos, and, and some army co four army cobras spotted a truck with mounted fifty caliber machine guns, and they made runs, the 50 caliber was bad for, bad news for helicopters. And uh, the 50 cals shot, the, shot three of the Cobras out of the air and the fourth one turned tail and ran. And uh, so that was, that was in the area, but we just, we, we heard it. We didn't, we, we didn't see it or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, saw some 50 caliber, and, and I heard this from guys, from instructors when I was in flight school, that. You'll know a 50 caliber at night because the round looks like a burning beer can coming at you because it's a large round, so it comes a little slower. And they were right; it looked like a, the size of a burning beer can. The, the tracer rounds coming at you at night, and uh, you knew when you saw those, you didn't want to argue with them. While you were there in Vietnam, did you have any infiltration around your base? Supposedly they caught some guy who was a North Vietnamese major or something going through our trash bin one time. He looked like a beggar, you know, and uh, they picked this guy up and supposedly he was a, a North Vietnamese major. Now that was, that was the story I heard. I don't, I don't have any confirmation on that. Did you pick up any of the Vietnamese language while you were there? No, not really. The, we had uh, what we call hooch maids, um, girls that kind of cleaned the area and things like that and, and uh, we generally talked in uh, used a one to one to ten scale number one was good number ten was bad so uh, uh, that was that was our, our biggest communic that was our the extent of our communication in most cases but uh, they didn't speak any English and we didn't really get into any Vietnamese did you spend any uh, any time extended so to speak in uh, away from your primary base? Oh, not extended. I, I spent a week in uh, the Philippines. They sent us up there for a jungle survival school and that was pretty much common after you were there about two months. They, they kind of gave you a, a break just to get away mm -hmm. and then had R&R. &R. Uh, I took my R&R &R down in uh, Sydney, Australia and was there for about a week. But uh, other than that, no, I was, I was there. Are, as regarding your love life, have, have you met your wife yet? Or uh... I had met her on a blind date when I was a flight student here in Cincinnati, but uh, we were corresponding by mail occasionally. That was about it. And what, uh, what was your what is your wife's name? Um, her name is Marty Marty Hamilton um, Ma Martha um, Ma shortened to Marty. Yeah, maiden name Wood Wood Wood. Now, did you meet her here in Cincinnati? Yes. Is she a Cincinnati native? She was born in Kentucky, but she pretty much grew up in Cincinnati, yes. Yeah. What part of Kentucky? Somerset. Oh, Somerset, yeah, yeah. Wood, I see. And uh, who introduced you, or how did you meet her? A fraternity brother of mine from Center College, a uh, fine gentleman, uh, Pat Ballard. Um, was in graduate school at the University of Cincinnati. He was a year older than I was and uh, had graduated second or third in his class at Center. He was a very intelligent uh, guy. And uh, I was coming home on Christmas leave from flight school. And I contacted him and said, hey, Pat, I'm coming through Cincinnati. Uh, you know, why don't you get me a date and we'll just go out and have a good time. And. Uh, <clears throat> Pat was uh, working, he had a full PhD fellowship in chemistry and he was working to get his master's degree because the draft was breathing down his neck and uh, 
So he had had like one or two dates with some girl and she's the one that got me the date. And uh, went to pick up, pick up my, my date and uh, the door opened and this very attractive girl opened the door and I said, oh, all right. And she said, oh, you must be here for my sister. And I said, oh, no. But then another very attractive girl came to the door. And uh, so that was, my, that was my date and we corresponded for about seven years. And uh, I got out of the Marine Corps in 74 and went to dental school at Case Western Reserve. And on my way from Pensacola there, I stopped in Cincinnati and saw her and we kind of rekindled the, the, the relationship. And uh, about a year later, we got married. So you got married when, 1975? 1975. And what about children? Two daughters. And their name? Um, Catherine Elizabeth Hamilton and Melissa Hamilton Reed. And uh, one was born in California, one was born in Guam. And uh, the, the older daughter, Catherine, lives in Colorado Springs. She works for uh, Colorado College out there in the theater department. And um, the other daughter lives in Fort Thomas and has three children. And um, that's where my wife spends most of her time, as, as much as she can. And uh, we're watching those three kids grow up and having a great time doing that. Uh, did, if we can, we'll jump back to Vietnam now. Um, so your tour is over in 1971. Yes. Uh, I, I think you said June of 71? Yes. And uh, where do you go from there? And are you still a first lieutenant? Still a first lieutenant. Uh, went back to Pensacola for my second tour. Uh, now as a flight instructor. And um, uh, I was, in, while I was in Vietnam, the squadron offered me a meritorious augmentation. In other words, I went from a reserve commission, a USMCR, to USMC, a regular commission. And it kind of gave me some connections, a little bit better connections, so I was able to swing the, the flight instructor tour in Pensacola, because that was a very coveted tour. Mm -hmm. And uh, down there with several other guys that I was in the squadron with there in Vietnam. And uh, that's where I really learned to fly, was in Pensacola. When you're, when you're teaching somebody else, that's when you kind of learn the techniques and you, you learn to anticipate their mistakes and, and things of this nature where in, in Vietnam the big thing was to learn to fly and talk on the radio at the same time. And uh, once we accomplished that, why then we could, we could just do what we wanted. But uh, to actually get the precision of flying, I felt was why I really learned that when I became a flight instructor. Uh, are you a flight instructor for helicopters? Yes. Yeah. Cobras? Well, no, it was Hueys. Hueys? Yes. Okay. And how long were you there? I was there three years. Three years. So at this point, have you decided to make the Marine Corps your career? No. Um, I, was, I was on the bubble. I was trying to decide what I wanted to do. Um, I was working the University of West Florida in Pensacola. Um, I had a degree in history and government. And I was actually working on a master's degree in history at night. And I had about two-thirds two of it completed. And uh, a long time before, I'd kind of thought about trying to go to dental school. And uh, I had no background, but my thoughts were that, well, it looked like a pretty nice, pretty nice job because you had a nice clean office with soft music playing and pretty girls running around. You were your own boss. You could uh, write your own schedule and things of this nature. But I just, I didn't have the background and didn't consider it. And then a good friend of mine, um, who's now in St. Louis, was taking courses to try to get in dental school, and he encouraged me. So I, I changed from my history over and I took some chemistry courses and some biology courses and things like that. And um, I was encouraged to take the, the dental aptitude test, the national test, which I did. And, uh, then I was encouraged to make some applications to school. Well, I thought I was a year away from really having enough background, but uh, I, I applied to some schools and uh, got rejected as I expected. And uh, I didn't hear anything from Case Western Reserve in Cleveland. And uh, so I called them up and I said, 
in June. I said, can I come up and just talk to somebody, see if I'm, you know, I'm older and see if I'm barking up the wrong tree, if this is a, the wrong thing for me. And I, I went up there and unbeknownst to me, they toured me around to all the members of the admissions committee. And uh, before I walked out of there, they said, can you be here August 18th to start school? What year? Um, 74. And uh, I said, I don't know if I can get out of the Marine Corps in time, because this was late June. And uh, so I went back to Pensacola and then went over to the Marine Air Detachment and ran into a young lady named Sergeant Weaver, who had just been transferred from Washington, D.C. And she said, I know the right people, I know the right paperwork, I'll get you out in time. Wow. So she got, I was actually my first, first month in dental school, I was still on active duty in the Marine Corps. So. If we had gone to full-scale war, I'd have been called back in a, in a heartbeat. But uh, she got me out, and uh, I wound up in dental school trying to figure out what different courses I was in. And it uh, took about a year to kind of get settled into full-time school and, and uh, everything else. So you started dental school in August of 74. And when did you complete uh, your training there at... Uh Case what uh, in uh, uh, May of '78. So it's a four-year program. Yes. And where did you set up practice uh, in your first? Well, I um, my second year I picked up a Navy scholarship, and which was great because I came out without owing anybody any money, and uh, I went in the Navy, um, and I went from uh, from went from Cleveland to Oakland, California, and uh, did a uh, one-year hospital internship. Uh, and uh, then spent two years in Guam and then was selected for oral surgery training and I was back to the hospital at Oakland. Spent three years there, two years on an aircraft carrier in Japan. Which aircraft carrier? Midway. Great bunch of people on there and what was, what was a, a great experience about that as, a, as an aviator, I was much more accepted than the average dentist was oh, yeah. uh, on board the carrier and I got to I qualified as a conning officer underway and got to control the ship. You still could wear your wings. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And uh, had, a, had a good tour on there, although we were, we were at sea about 75% of the time. We were home ported out of Yokosuka, Japan, and we were in, in the Indian Ocean the whole time. And that's when Cold War was still on, and we had Russian bears flying over us and, and, and things like that. So it was... Uh, you were married by this time. Married with the two kids, and it was a little tough being away from them all that, for that period of time. But and, uh, and she's living where? In Japan. Oh, she's living in Japan. Right. Ah. And uh, it was it was a little bit of an experience for the kids because they were blonde-haired, and the Japanese love blonde-haired kids, and so they got to do a lot of modeling and and things like this. And so they she kept busy taking them around and the. It was, a, it was a really good experience. The model eight, modeling agencies had girls that would be assigned to them and they'd take them all around. And it was a, they, they really enjoyed that. So uh, continue with your naval time then, if you would. Well, let's see. Um, after the aircraft carrier, I came back and I was at the Naval Hospital at Camp Pendleton. And a uh, very enjoyable tour down there in Southern California. What rank are you now? Um, I'm now commander, 05 in the Navy. Um, I got uh, promoted, uh, when, I, when I came in the Navy, the Navy only gave me half credit for my time in the Marine Corps. So I was, came in as an 03, and um, I made 04 when we were in Guam, and then 05 in Japan. And uh, was the head of oral surgery at the Naval Hospital at Camp Pendleton. Uh, we had a family practice residency program there. We had interns there, so I got to do teaching and uh, got to do a lot of surgery there. I had uh, more trauma there than we'd had in our, in our residency program at, o at Oakland because the, the Marines were always beating up on each other and, and uh, a lot of sports injuries and things like that. So we had a lot of broken jaws and things like that to deal with, which was nice that uh, I hadn't had a, a whole lot of experience with before. but. Uh, my goal had always been to retire from the military before my kids hit high school. Because I had seen people that, you know, Johnny or Jane is going to be a senior in high school and all of a sudden dad gets orders to go someplace else. And uh, 
sometimes the kids would stay behind with another family because they were involved in sports or something like this and the family would take off or the the kid would have to be dragged into a brand new school for their senior year or something right. like this so my goal was so I, I got out when my daughter was in eighth my oldest daughter was in eighth grade so that was my 20 years and that was perfect timing it uh, worked out well um, actually from from Pensac from uh, Pendleton I did get transferred to uh, Pensacola back to Pensacola. back to Pensacola my third tour and I was uh, at the Naval Dental Center there and uh, that's when Desert Storm I oh, we couldn't sell our house in California because Saddam Hussein marched into Kuwait and the crash the stock market crashed and the guy who was going to buy our house bailed and so I had to leave my family in California and I went to Pensacola and uh, um, Desert Storm ha I went I went to a movie in the afternoon I came out and turned on the radio and that's when George Bush had made the decision to bomb over in uh, this is 1990 isn't it 1990 yes yes um, yeah, ninety, ninety-one, yeah. And uh, you're still on active duty. Still on active Navy. duty. And so I went back to the I went back to the unit, the dental center, and I said, because they were starting to mobilize, and I said, you know, turn me in, turn my name in to go, because why take some guy from his family when I'm already separated from my family anyway? You know, I might as well go over there. And so. Uh, there was a unit, there was a number of people out of, out of Pensacola. We all got shipped to Charleston to stage out of there. Um, there was an anesthesiologist from the hospital and a, an x-ray tech and then a couple other corpsmen. And we, got, we met up with a, a larger group um, in Charleston and we got flown to Bahrain. And um, we were what was called the Tarawa group. Well, the, the plan was the Marines were going to make an amphibious landing into um, Kuwait and come around this way on the Iraqis and Schwarzkopf was coming up this way on the Iraqis and uh, they were concerned that this was going to be the, the heaviest casualties going into Kuwait because all the beaches were mined and everything like this. So our role was to when the Marines left the, uh, the transports, the LHAs and the LPHs, the bays under of those of those air, of those uh, ships can be turned into operating rooms, ICUs, things of this nature. So we were going to be the medical units that were going to go in and fill those spots. Mm -hmm. Well, the fortunate thing was that General Schwarzkopf and his tanks rounded up the Iraqis, and they were given up faster than anything else, and the, there was no. Uh, no amphibious assault into Kuwait. So we were kind of sitting there doing a whole lot of nothing. So we were some of the sh first people that got shipped home too. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, some of the group went, went over to a, uh, went over to hospitals in uh, Navy fleet hospitals in Saudi Arabia. I got left there in, in, uh, in Bahrain and uh, with a reserve hospital. And, and that was kind of interesting to see these reservists who had joined thinking that they could go once a month and have a nice weekend and then now all of a sudden they were pulled out of their private practices and they were some of them were just matter and, matter and all get out and others said I talked to a couple of them and said hey I knew what I was getting into when I signed up and I'm here sure. but there were others that were really mad too so but uh, it was interesting so when did you so when did they uh, when did you come home or back to the states I should say yeah um, I want to say it was about February probably of, of uh, 91 February 91 I think it was I know it was it was cold and snowing in Cleveland because I stopped to see my mother uh, before I went to California and uh, and you, at this point you've got 22 years in the in the Marine Corps and Navy well I've got I've got about 20 20 active and then I was, like when I was in dental school, that was four years of reserve duty there. And I had two years of credit from uh, when I first signed the line in the Marine Corps before I went on active duty. So I had 20 years active and about 26 total. Okay, uh, so 69, 79, 89, and we're 91. 
60, right. started as 60, actually 67 is when I signed up that's the papers. That's right, I'm sorry, forgive me for that. 66 yeah. actually I signed yeah. the papers. And, that's and, right, yeah. So I got my math wrong, that's normal for me though. That, uh, so when do, you, when do you decide to uh, retire completely from the Navy? Well, like I say, this was, this was brewing. I wanted to get out before the kids hit school. And uh, it, it, it looked like a good time. I, had, uh, I made contact here in Cincinnati and, and found somebody who was looking at selling their, uh, their practice. And uh, so I said, uh, you know, I've got my 20, I've got my retirement, I've got my medical benefits. Uh, the kids are not in high school yet, so I've met all those goals. So let's see what's next. So you came to Cincinnati? Came to Cincinnati. And uh, where did you set up practice at? Um, on the west side in, in Cheviot. Uh, purchased a practice from uh, Dr. Dylan Rodenbaugh. And uh, he was there for, we, we were there together for a year. And then he retired. And um, I was there in that office for five years and then moved out a little farther west to Dent um, and uh, was well, there from 97 until I retired here in 16. And, and when? 2000, September of 16. Uh, uh -huh. And what year did you up and know in Cheviot? Uh, 92. 92 and retired completely in 2016. Yes. From your office in Dent? Yes. Yeah. With your uh, uh, Vietnam experiences, did you stay in contact with anybody you served with? Oh yes. I've got a core of people that, uh, uh, matter of fact, next month I'm going to a surprise 70th birthday party for one of them over in uh, Camp Hill, Pennsylvania, outside of, uh, outside of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of years ago I, I bid on uh, four tickets to the Army-Navy game and we had uh, one guy from Abilene, Texas, one from St. Louis, one from Camp Hill, and myself all went to uh, Philadelphia for the Army-Navy game. You were all uh, veterans together? We, we were all in the same squadron in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I, I participate with the Marine Corps Scholarship Foundation. Um, I think it's a wonderful, wonderful charity providing scholarships for uh, children of wounded and deceased Marines. And uh, we have get-togethers. Uh, there's a big one I haven't been to called Patriots at Pebble. They keep inviting me to play golf at Pebble Beach for this thing, but I don't think my golf game is, is, is good enough to go out and go to Pebble Beach, but everybody tells me to keep going. So one of these years I may go out for that. Okay. But uh, yeah, some of my, my closest friends are still guys I was in the Marine Corps with. Do you have reunions? Yes. Um, we have squadron reunions. Um, there's a Marine Corps helicopter uh, society that they have a whole, whole bunch of guys will get together, but uh, uh, and, it, and we'll have small squadron reunions at those those gatherings also, but uh, yeah, those are those are good times. We sit around and tell lies, and mm -hmm. the, the fish always get bigger the, <laughs> each time the, the stories are told. But uh, just just very fortunate to be involved with such a just such a great group of people. Just. Just men. Mm -hmm. Who did their duty and served their country. And we all kind of look at, I, I think we look at a lot of things in much the same way. Yeah, we just, uh, we have good times and, and uh, we take things seriously. The, the, the four guys I mentioned, uh, one in Abilene, Texas, retired as a colonel, uh, flew Harriers and then was CEO of a rehab hospital out there in, in Texas and did a lot of work with that. Um, the other guy in St. Louis is a dentist. He's the one that kind of encouraged me to pursue a dental career. The other is a stockbroker in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. So these are not ne'er-do-wells and I, I know that uh, I can remember the times when we were coming back home from Vietnam and the, the military was looked down on and, and uh, that was my next question. Uh, when you came back from Vietnam, did you any, encounter any problems with the, the student protests and things of that nature? No, um, not directly. We were advised not to wear our uniforms in public, um, things of this nature. Um, I remember in, uh, oh, it would have been early 70, 
before I went to Vietnam, I went up with a friend of mine to Philadelphia, and he said, wear your, your, green, wear your green uniform. I said, well, we're not supposed to, he says, where? He says, I know where to go. We went, he took us to a bar. We didn't buy a drink all night. We were in uniform, and there were people buying us drinks and, uh, and everything else, so you, you had to know the right places to go. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, never had any, any direct conflict with it, uh, or if I, if I did, it was very peripheral. I could just walk away from it, but I wasn't directly uh, confronted. Uh, at this point, I use uh, Brian. I usually ask Brian if he has any questions. Uh, Couple of questions. Uh, is there a reason why the Marines? You were interested in the Marines. Absolutely. Um, my advisor at Center College was Dr. Charles Lee. Dr. Lee had been a Marine in the Korean War. He had gotten wounded very severely and was told he would never walk again. And uh, he returned to the States and was at Bethesda. Matter of fact, one of his roommates was uh, General Cushman, who was later Commandant of the Marine Corps. And uh, he said he got up the first day and uh, said he was going to feel sorry for himself and decided that wasn't any fun, so he decided he wasn't going to do that anymore. Went back to the University of North Carolina, got his PhD in history. And I was fortunate to have him as my advisor. And the man that he was is what encouraged me to go in the Marine Corps. He had every reason to be bitter at the Marine Corps. And he, he wasn't at all. We, we, he t taught a Civil War course. And we'd go out, and he'd wear an old Marine uniform when we were marching the battlefield at Paraville. And uh, very proud of his time in the Marine Corps. And uh, I just decided there must be something here. Plus, they got the best looking uniforms. <laughs> um, was flying something you were always interested in, or is that something you kind of discovered that you had an interest in at some point? When I was at uh, Quantico, um, there was an announcement made, you know, anybody that's interested in aviation report here to take this test. And uh, I think it was the FARAQT, which I have no idea what that stands for. And I went and took those tests and I scored real well. A lot of it was uh, spatial relations and things like this. And uh, so then I just kind of sat down. I could have, I had a decision to make and I just decided, well, you know, if you get into aviation, maybe you could be an airline pilot someday or something like that. So just trying to trying to look 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 ahead a little bit, and so that was what kind of got me interested in aviation. Decided to go to aviation, and then I wound up in helicopters. I want, of course, I want to be a Blue Angel and all that stuff. But uh, I got into helicopters, and, and I, I really enjoyed helicopters because we had a great relationship with the, the ground marines. That uh, the the fixed wing pilots really didn't didn't have that relationship, and uh, so that's. Right where I wound up in, in aviation. Was there a particular uh, aircraft that you, you, you uh, enjoyed flying more than others? Well, the Cobra was the, the Cadillac aircraft to fly when I was in, and, and I had that opportunity. And uh, the, the Huey was, was similar enough, um, and I, I had a, a, a bunch of time in that as a flight instructor that, uh, that I enjoyed that. So, most anything made by Bell at that time was uh, was where I was and what I enjoyed. But certainly the Cobra was the we were we were kind of the, the cat's meow at that time as far as the Marine Corps. What what could a Cobra do that you couldn't and vice versa? Hey, can you compare the two? Well, we carried a much we carried a much larger ordnance load. We were much more accurate. Uh, we were faster. Uh, we were a smaller target. Um, I can remember working with uh, an Air Force controller one time, and he had targets for us, and uh, he'd, he'd say, he'd point us, point us out something, and he'd say, okay, move your next hits six feet to the right. So when you're, when you're moving rockets six feet from a, from a moving aircraft, that, that's pretty accurate. 
and he was he was seeing he was giving us feedback saying you know I've, I've never seen anybody so any, any group of aircraft so accurate as you guys so uh, that's why he was given us six foot increments wow. when you had that crash did you have orders like to, to destroy your craft or anything no, um, because we wanted to try to sal salvage anything we could. If, if nothing else, we could get parts out of it. And uh, so the, the only thing was the radio. That was the primary thing. And you didn't want to leave anything behind, like uh, maps or frequency cards or anything like that that the bad guys could get hold of. But uh, no, we, we were, because they could get an aircraft in there. The, 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 the 53s that I talked about, they'd hang a sling down, they'd tie into the main mass that the, the rotor was, attack, was attached to and just pick it right up out of there. And uh, I've got pictures, they, they brought it back and somewhere I've got pictures of, uh, of the aircraft and the uh, hole in the, in the hole, bullet hole in the compressor, which is what, uh, what brought us down. Did you have a lot of equipment uh, repairs that had to be done on the, or maintenance usually on the uh, well, the, most of the maintenance was, was uh, all set up time-wise. Uh, after X number of hours, this would be done. Uh, just like a, like a car, you need an oil change after a certain number of miles. And uh, I qualify, I was, a, I was a pimp. We called it pimp, but it was post-maintenance inspection pilot. And uh, after an aircraft would go in and have certain amount, certain work done, or if a pilot brought an aircraft back and had a complaint about it, that it would have a we get what we'll call beats. If the, the rotor was a little out of balance or something like this, the, the aircraft would get more vibration. So it would come in for, uh, for maintenance and then we would, we would take the aircraft out and fly it before we'd actually put it back online for, for combat. And uh, we would make sure that it was, uh, it was uh, maintenance wise, it was healthy. You know, we've gotten various uh, people's uh, impressions of Vietnam. I was curious of what your impressions of Vietnam as a, as a country, as a flying around in that area with the terrain and stuff. What, what was your impression of Vietnam? Well, we were, on, we were on the coast, and on the coast where all the rice paddies were. And it seemed like primarily an agrarian country that, you know, most of the people couldn't have cared less about what was going on. They wanted to raise their rice crops and, and get them turned in. Now, what was going on as far as infiltration of the Viet Cong and and uh, things of that nature. I know that there were, one of, the, one of the things the Viet Cong would do would go into a village and take a young girl and amputate her arm about the elbow and cauterize it. And she was the walking visible sign of their presence at all times. But uh, I really think that all they wanted to do was be left alone in that agrarian economy. They, they'd been doing it for centuries and they that was that was the way of life to them. The, the cities had turned into a certain degree of capitalism and, and uh, overcrowding, uh, lack of sanitary facilities, um, and everybody out trying to make a buck one way or another that they could, whether it was stealing or counterfeiting or producing low quality goods. That's that's pretty much what it was. Mm. Um, Not a particularly enjoyable place. Uh, did you get to uh, get much uh, R and R? Would you go somewhere if you got R and R, like out of country, or did you stay in Vietnam? Well, I, I took the one trip to the Philippines for the survival school. Went to Sydney, Australia, for my R and R. Had a had a wonderful time down there with uh, just seeing a cosmopolitan environment again and getting to eat. Uh, good Western food in a, in a nice hotel restaurant, things like that. That was a real pleasure. And got, uh, I got a, like a long weekend trip to Hong Kong. And uh, that was enjoyable. I really, really enjoyed that. And uh, it, was, it was funny, it was in Hong Kong that I bought the ring that I later gave to my wife as an engagement ring. Now we, we not totally true because we took the diamond out of it and let her pick her setting. But uh, that was where I got it at the big facility, the big military facility there in Hong Kong. And uh, uh, I was wondering, did, you, did they ever get any USO shows or anything like that come through your way? We, we did. We had uh, uh, 
bands that would come through and perform at the Oak Club every once in a while. And um, somewhere I've got some pictures of a, a Huey painted red and white saying Ho Ho Hope on it when Bob Hope was over there carrying him around. And uh, but uh, at, at Little Marble Mountain there every once in a while we get a we get an Australian band or we get a Filipino band or something like that to come in there occasionally. A floor show is what we called them. Well, I got one last question. So, what was your impression of the Middle East when you went over there? That's a different part of the world. <sighs> that yeah, and we were we were plunked down in Bahrain. And Bahrain, I consider kind of like the Las Vegas of the Middle East, because the, the non-drinking, pork-eating Arabs would come to Bahrain to party and drink and, and uh, do everything like that with the, in the, the big hotels downtown there. But uh, we, were, we were very isolated when I was there. We, Brown and Root is a, a uh, British construction company, and they'd been over there and built a Babco as British Oil and Petroleum was there and they built all this. And we stayed at this Brown and Root construction camp and uh, we got two meals a day uh, until I raised Cain about that. But uh, probably the most productive, or the thing I remember most out of there, we came over with a Navy captain, a surgeon, as our leader of our group. And he didn't like staying in this Brown and Root compound so he and a couple of his buddies skedaddled and went to downtown Bahrain and stayed in some big fancy hotel. So I was the senior guy left. And uh, I was rooming with an anesthesiologist, a nurse, and uh, uh, a surgeon, reserve surgeon. And one night this Marine comes in with his backpack and drops it on the floor and says, I'm your new roommate. And uh, that encouraged me to kind of take a little bit more control of the situation. I got us organized as a unit, um, got us standing our own watches. I went to the, the base in Bahrain and, and uh, got guys, young guys uh, appointments with lawyers who had not filled out wills and things like this before they left and, and got, the, got the whole group kind of organized into a, into a unit. Uh, the, the, Queen Mary was over there and they, it was for entertainment. They had floor shows and good food on there and I got our guys on there. So I was able to exercise a little bit of leadership and, and, uh, and uh, got, some, got some thanks from some guys. And I remember we had one ENT surgeon and uh, he insisted he wanted to carry a weapon. And uh, I said, this is a medical group, you're, you're not gonna carry a weapon. He said, I want a weapon. I said, no, over my dead body. So we, we called him Frank Burns. Um, from then on out, and uh, the the countryside didn't have a whole lot of exposure to the the, the people or the countryside. Um, I went over to uh, an army facility and did a bunch of oral surgery over at an army facility, and we stopped at a Dairy Queen on the way back. So that was about as much exposure I had to the the locals, and uh, we got to uh, we got to go up to Babco. They would invite invite us up there. But they were all Brits, so it wasn't wasn't locals up there. But uh, got tired of the hearing the call to prayer from the the mosques. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's 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 not the Eagles playing music. It's a, a different kind of music that I didn't particularly enjoy. Well, thank you. That's my last. You know, I have one question I would like to go back to the very beginning. You said that you could not fire your weapon unless you were granted permission or authorized to fire. What does that mean and what did you mean by that? We had to call into uh, Da Nang DASC, uh, Direct Air Support Center. We had to call them and say, okay, here's our situation. We've got bad guys, whatever, we're taking fire, whatever. And they had to go to their little map and call the village chieftains and see what was going on, make sure we weren't going to shoot good guys because the good guys would shoot at us too. And uh, we had several episodes of, uh, of that. Uh, when we'd go out on night medevac, we'd launch out of Marble Mountain and the first place we'd go to, there was a, a bridge directly south of the main runway at the Big Da Nang Airport, the Caddo Bridge, and we'd wait there to get clearance for them to shut off artillery 
so we could go out in the area to get to the medevacs. And we'd take fire out of the, this South Vietnamese station down there on this bridge. Friendly fire. Friendly fire. Yeah. And uh, so we were told we could not return fire to them, but I more than once told my co-pilot, I said, if we take fire, you shoot, at least shoot in the river. You know, let them know that, you know, we're here and, and we're not gonna mess around and just right. knock it off. And why, and then there was a, there was a prisoner of war camp at the south end of our main runway, controlled by the South Vietnamese. We'd come in, and come in there and at dusk, you could, every once in a while you'd take a tracer up out of there too. Out of the POW camp. Yeah. Well, when you're in enemy territory, so to speak, and they're firing at you, you, did you have to wait until you were authorized to return fire? We did. How did that trouble you or bother you? or I mean, Were you frustrated? Uh, oh, absolutely. Angry? Absolutely. And uh, I just finished reading a book called Dereliction of Duty mm -hmm. by H.R. McMaster uh, about the Johnson and uh, McNamara and the political control of the entire Vietnam situation and how it was all measured response and all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. Because if we, if we wanted to win that war, we had the weapons and the people to go in there and win it very quickly. But uh, we were Did you ever, we were controlled I mean, by the politicians. Were you in a lot of peril at times because waiting for permission to return fire? Absolutely. It's hard to believe, isn't it? Well, we went out, I can remember one time we went out and uh, there was a building, it was a pink building, it was a school, it was a government building, it wasn't a school, I don't think, it was a government building. And uh, the Viet Cong had come in and taken over this building and run the Viet Cong flag up the flagpole outside. And they were they were still shooting from this building, and we were told that we could not shoot the building because it was a symbol of the new South Vietnamese government and what they were going to do for the people. And so we decided, well, we're going to at least shoot at that flagpole. And uh, to try to hit a flagpole with rockets, that's 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 a pretty narrow target. And uh, my co-pilot. A guy named Jack Robillard was controlling the turret and he said he slipped and he launched a couple of grenades into that, into that building. Okay. But uh, yeah, we were, there, we were very confined politically um, by what we could do and what we couldn't do. If, if, the, if the Americans got a prisoner that they wanted to get, generally get information from, they turn them over to the Rock Marines, and the Rock Marines would get the information from them, because of the cultural difference, the, the Americans didn't understand how to deal with with the the Asian culture over there, but the mm -hmm. Rock Marines did. Mm -hmm. And then, so they got the information. That, They'd get the information. Yeah. Well, Bob, I want to I want to thank you for this interview. It's been very enlightening and very educational. And as uh, a friend of mine used to say, you're now part of, of American history with this interview. And it's just been a pleasure to meet you and know you and to have you relate your story. And I wanna thank you for your service to our country. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it very much. <laughs>